king or whatever. Okay, we, uh, the best thing I can do is, uh, we can do is just respond to this concern and, and see what the best way to do it for, from your standpoint. Because we did, what we saw, we saw some valleys that we don't know how to explain. And also, there were some situations in a way we really did not know the criteria that you have used. Yeah, I guess the, the part B of, or number two is, is sort of what was the criteria, and we don't know of any regulatory criteria to define what is significant or deficiencies or gaps in energy. So we were just trying to make a statement there saying that, one, you will expect to see variations in the PSD, and the range of variations that we're seeing in our computer PSDs is about a factor of 10 to 25 if you look at the peaks and valleys across the whole frequency range. So um, that's the statement we were trying to make, and we weren't trying to sort of introduce or, or suggest there's any regulatory guidance as to how to quantify this. Okay. But how do you judge what is adequate or not? We had actually gone back in one of our earlier public calls. We had talked about how we developed a target PSD following the um, information provided in Appendix B of SRP 371. And when we do that and apply it to our site-specific case, we can show that we exceed not only the 80% limit of the target PSD, but as well the actual PSD without the 80% reduction. And so in our judgment, we feel that we're satisfying any type of PSD type requirement. Um, in our last call, we were asked not to provide a comparison of the target PSD with our PSD values, but just to provide the PSD plots. And so that's what we've done. Do you have any co comment or anything? Well, I, I guess this is still then um, somewhat open um, uh, because we don't see a basis why what is shown now is sufficient. Um, uh, you, you what is proposed, you know, they say 10 to 12, 10 to 25 above or below the average PSD values. It, that a factor of 10 to 25, that sounds quite large. No, I don't know what that means really. Is it 10 times that or 25 times? Or is it 1.1, 10%, 25 percent? If you go from the, the sort of the range from the minimum, because I'm plotting things on a log scale, so it's a factor of 10 to 25, which does seem like a lot, but again, our comparisons with our target PSD shows that we're exceeding the target PSD, so we feel that we have sufficient energy throughout the frequency range of concern. Yeah. Well, sticking with, with this 10 to 25, um, I, I think that the way it's written in the response, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's not written that's what's observed. I think it's written as if that is your criterion. Okay. Um, we can change our response then, the RAI response, to clarify that. <laughs> Oh, okay. Because uh, we don't have any, we don't have any uh, regulatory justification to quantify things, and I, I apologize that the way it's written makes it appear that that's what we're banking ourselves on by saying uh -oh. it's significant because it's of it. Observa you think it's an observation, then? Yeah. Right? Okay. And um, I don't know if, you're aware, if you've been following uh, SRP 371, Appendix B, um, the staff is in the process of, you know, revising that. Are you aware of that? Correct. We're aware of that, and we're also aware of the fact that following the spectral matching criteria that we've done, um, we don't exceed our spectral match in the response spectra by more than 30%, so actually we're not required by our options to have to compute and show the PSD. We've done that as a request, um, but following the spectral matching criteria in 371, we're not required to do that. Yeah. Well, um, I agree with you. You know, the SRP in general quote is not a requirement. It's, it's a guidance of an acceptable, you know, method. Um, but I agree with you. It's not a requirement. But uh, if you can identify some other means to judge the adequacy, you know, staff will review it. Uh, if not, uh, calculating a target spectrum and comparing it is one of the methods that the industry utilizes. But I agree with you. It's not quoting a requirement. 
Correct. Um, and Appendix B, uh, the fine, uh, final version, will be coming out, I think, in a matter of weeks. Um, so you may want to look for that for uh, updated guidance. That, you know, it's up to you if you use that or some other method. But I think right now there's still a concern about dips and deficiencies in the uh, in, uh, in comparison to the, not comparison, but the calculation of the PSD. So can I ask a clarification? Can I, on our last phone call, it was indicated to us that uh, the draft revision of SRP 371 was actually probably going to be resubmitted as a draft for public comment. And is just say make it sounds like it's going to come out in final form. Well, I, I don't want to speak ahead of uh, myself. Um, I'm not sure now, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it, 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 it just comes out. But don't quote me. I don't know. Okay, because, yeah, the last call we had, it was indicated that it had been out for draft for several months, and they were considering making some revisions and resubmitting it as a draft for public comment, so not in its final form. And they actually didn't have a timeline as to when they expected that to be resubmitted in draft form. Well, regardless if it's draft or final, I'm saying the next issuance, uh, I think, will shed a lot more light, and you may be able to take advantage of that. That's okay. what I'm trying to say. Okay. So, uh, how did you leave it now that you would respond to these questions? So, we will modify the text with regards to making an emphasis as an observation this 10 to 25, and we can also as well explain in detail how we calculate our PSD. Okay. Um, and we will go back and reevaluate and possibly consider taking a more restrictive time window for calculation of our PSD. We, all right. And then one last thing, uh, you still, I think, need to consider how to demonstrate that you don't have deficiencies in energy across the frequency range of interest. You still lack that. Well, it depends on what, what it looked like. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so... Um, Committee has taken an action to revise the response to 37112 based on information and guidance identified during this conversation. That's basically the bottom line. Yeah, fair. That's correct. Sounds good. Okay. Which one is the next? I think that was the only three identified the by the committee. Oh, okay. Is that correct? That's the. Uh, those were the three seismic REIs to discuss today. Correct. And then we did have the additional uh, geotechnical RI. Right. So okay. We'll move on to RI question 251-8. I'll let uh, my colleagues from NRC take the reins for this conversation. And uh, okay. Dominion provided information. Figures. Draft figures. Um, I'm, I'm easy as far as whoever wants to start, whether it's Dominion or, or else. Let's have Dominion start in a minute, please. This is for 2518. Where did you get the 2518? Oh, oh, that means. Yeah, hi, this is, this is Scott um, Linval. Um, and uh, we submitted seven draft figures just to show, illustrate how we're, how we're going to be responding to part A here of 251 8 uh, with respect to the. Um, the Harris Creek Fault and its geomorphic expression in some places, but a lack of geomorphic expression in others. Um, so, Alice, chime in if you've got any questions, but just as a general, we've got th uh, three, well, two pairs of figures, 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, and 3A, B, and C. Um, the, which figures two and three are zooming into those areas of the more detailed boxes that you can see on figure 1a but we're trying to provide counterparts with the geology of Burton et al the most recent detailed mapping in 1a 2a and 3a and then figure B's illustrate or include the um, a vertically exaggerated uh, elevation a DEM in which we've by three times by a factor of three and uh, it's got the slope ramped on it. And so the slope, instead of a colored slope map, we're doing it in gray, black and black and white, or gray shades of gray, which should, um, which help um, illustrate or, or 
bring out very, very subtle features. Um, and we've played with different settings, different exaggerations, and this, this, this approach appears to uh, pull out that northwest facing escarpment the best that we could, we could, we could do. In figure 3C, we have the hillshade uh, with no vertical exaggeration at all. So you can see how very subdued the topography here is. In, in, in the B figures, um, where we've got the slope map on the derivative on the vertically exaggerated DEM, it, it's, it's, you know, looks like you've got much steeper terrain than we actually have out there. But this is for the point of trying to illustrate things. Um, and so, Alice, what we plan to do is just walk through a description of each portion of the escarpment or linear topographic feature along the Harris Creek Fault uh, and, and note those observations corresponding to each of these letters A through G that you can see shown on uh, figures 2B, 3B, and 3C. Um, but with the most important point is that the northwest facing slope that seems to define this feature in the topography does indeed um, disappear as you move toward the northeast. And that was a point that I think you were, you had a problem trying to correspond, uh, correlate between our previous text and figures. Well, you got the REI. I mean, yeah. I. And I think I explained what I was looking at and what my my issue was, that, you know, your text and, and your figures weren't exactly supporting yourself. You're making a, a strong argument about um, the, topogra the topographic changes in that to be mostly because of, of different... Yeah. ...logic stuff. Okay, and then I pointed out there were those two figures in uh, question... 4B, uh, figure 5 and figure 6, where I kind of like thought I saw counter evidence, you know, to kind of like to argue with you about that. So, right. So, so I have, I looked through the figures and okay. um, there are a few comments that, that I would make. Are you, are you going to go into more detail right now or is this just the set of figures that you're, you're planning on doing and the text is going to follow? Oh, the text will follow, and I just we just wanted to give you an idea where we're going. Uh, also, there are two other figures we'll be providing as part of Part A as well, and that will be the um, what was the relief map, um, which that was a relief that map, and it was not a not an elevation map. So it shows differences in elevation along across a 50 uh, 500 meter radius right so, uh, it's local relief exactly it's not topography exactly. it's not slope but it's local relief but i mean it's a right. derivative i mean it shows what it shows yes and we'll show a corresponding map of the same uh, air, uh extent that shows uh color ramp elevation so you can see that the actual you know so you noted that the red uh disappears or, or stops at the margins of the uh, projection of the, the rupture plane yeah. to the north. Well, it's the epicentral area, too. Pardon? It's the boxes that define the epicentral area and the right. whale flop projection. Right. So, and, and you, you uh, posited that, hey, maybe this is because there is tectonic um, a signature here. And my, the, the pair of the two other figures, one elevation, one local relief, will illustrate that the higher topography is outside the box and that these, the higher relief or the redder areas are really focused along the South Anna River um, and the steeper slopes that, that that incision has created there. It happens to coincide with the box. And we've seen that on other rivers. If you back off and do the same kind of thing for a more regional picture, you'll get those local relief reds, if you will, following the river drainages up in the, you know, in the Piedmont. Okay, all right. Well, let me, um, let me talk can about, I ask, go on. Uh, can I ask a question, just a clarification here on 
where we say the staff notes that the northwest facing escarpment lineament clearly extends northeast of Beaver Creek. And I guess what what I there's a lot of things that our eyes can 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 connect the dots, if you will, in the landscape. Little little fingers of drainages, little, and uh, but in terms of the northwest facing escarpment. Um, that's where we would contend that you don't see it. It does die out, and in figure, what we'll we'll go through and enumerate each of the observations. But in F, the actual escarpment is occurring not on the Harris Creek fault as mapped by um, Burton at all. It's actually on the unnamed fault that veers to the north, um, a little more northerly, and that again is is it a, is separating. Diorite, which is more easily erodible, it's more mafic than the granite diorite. Okay, well, we can talk about that. Um, okay. So, by figure 5B in the original Q4 uh, it looks a little bit different than your figure 2B in 3B. And I did note that the lineament is not as obvious as it was previously on the figure 5B. So I don't know if there was a difference in processing or if it's just, you know, some artifact or something. Um, and you're right. I mean, uh, the lineament is in the eye of the believer. But when you hold it, you know how you typically can hold up the sheet to your eye and look down yes. at it. I can see it. And and if we were in the same room, perhaps we could see it the same way. And, and when I look at your new figures, um, I can see, like, a 2B. I can see that the lineage clearly dies out. It's harder to pick out, and it does die out uh, to the southwest of segment D. It's, it's clearly going away. And then on figure 3B, and we get to the Beaver Creek point, which is like kind of like the point of contention, um, right. it, I mean, it obviously dies out to the northeast eventually, too. But I do see it, as I saw it in the original 5B, I see it beyond... Um, the, uh, the uh, Beaver Creek, and I also looked, looking at 3B, I transferred what I thought was the northwest facing escarpment picks, so to speak, mm -hmm. and put them on here, and I sketched in the Harris Creek Fault, and I sketched in the splay of the Harris Creek Fault, and I sketched in the Pluton and the Chappawamsic. And what I see mm -hmm. is I see three things that are not aligned on that figure 3B. Uh, under G and S, they are three separate elements, and they only really converge in seg around the difference, be the gap between segment E and C. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So at that point, that escarpment is certainly not lined up with either the Splay Fault or the Harris Creek, and... It also is not lying on the contact between the Pluton and the Chapalomsic either. So it's still not a look. That escarpment, if it's anything, that topographic lineament is not what I would consider an erosional difference at that point. So, so Alex, the way you, you're mm -hmm. saying oh, to the northeast, so it's just southwest of Beaver Creek. Well, I mean, it's merging, okay? Mm -hmm. But right. it's most distinct, I mean, I guess because I picked it up on figure the original 5B. And, and I just, and we have a closer view here, we have different figures. I'm taking points, um, mm -hmm. and taking points off of these different figures and transferring by eyeball. You know, I don't have GIS. So um, how accurate is this? But um, I, I see that the, the splay fault, and I guess it's the Harris Creek splay fault, Yep. Um, is going further is, is shifted a little bit swinging to the to the uh, north. more to the north yeah I gotta hold the paper right. and the Harris Creek is trending northeast and this and the scarf of the topographic lineament is in between it splits the difference in between so it doesn't to me it still is not lining up where there is a contrast in lithology it seems to be independent of that that's all well, we'll do a closer check. We thought okay. on the GIS, it looked like the, in part F, the strong topographic lineament there is coincident with the splay fall the from the diorite. Yeah, it's getting, it's getting very close. But then when it moves, when it moves, just as it's going across, 
uh, Beaver Creek. There is, there's going to be, uh, it, it continues, the uh, lineament goes off on its own. And it's in, it's located in Chapawamsic entirely. Chapawamsic to Chapawamsic. Now, again, so in terms of the holder, what is the lineament consist of? Is your eye picking up dr the drainage, or is there a... Oh, sure. I'm sure some of it has to do with the, that. Yeah. Right. Um, I, all I can tell you is that when I'm looking at the original 5B and I look down, and I look down that scarp, it's, it kind of pops out, um, almost like, uh, like stereo. Uh, a little bit, and it does at that far end there. It is lined up with the with the drainage with that with that tributary. So right. I mean, it might be that might be a tributary thing, um, but it certainly isn't an erosional contrast between the Pluton and the Chapawamsic at that point. I, so. I would agree with that. The question I, that we're we're going to try to illustrate is that what is producing the strong lineament, i.e., the slope, the northwest facing slope. Uh, or escarpment, if you will, does die out at, at, at about Beaver Creek. I, I can't see it. across the tributary. There's not a strong uh, change in relief or elevation. Right. It's a, that same feature. Now there are other, as you say, there are other features. In fact, we've played games too. Looking at looking at this, you, it's almost like a ink spot test. You can <laughs> your eyes can pick out a lot of lineaments. Yeah. But in terms of what's What's the prominent lineament consist of? It's a slope. It's it's in places at its highest, its greatest um, uh, elevation change. I think it's about pushing 15 meters, but it's got a maximum slope of about 10 degrees. So it's very. It's, it's not something that looks like you know if you you have a fault scarp over time with multiple events, you're like you wouldn't get something as shallow as 10 degrees with that kind of relief, and then have that sort of feature just all of a sudden stop uh, in a short, a very short distance. Right. I never, I don't really, I, I guess in the long run, I don't really think that it was a false scarf necessarily. It was somewhat aligned with Harris Creek and, uh, let's see, let's go back to the uh, figure 1A. You know, there's that roundabout farm fault, there's the Harris Creek mm -hmm. fault, there's the splay, and then there's the quail fault. And depending upon what portion you're looking at, some of those features are lining up with each other and sometimes they're not. So, um, but your argument was so strong and certain in your original REI response that this was only um, contrast between different lithologic units, uh, erodibility, and that is what popped out to me and that was I didn't it didn't agree I mean my what I saw didn't agree with that with it being definitively that difference and in and, and you use that difference in erodibility to rule out other things okay so I'm just I just wanted to be careful about that and then also in that original that original figure six that which is the LIDAR relief map the local relief yes you know, you use that as an erodibility contrast uh, illustration too, and it doesn't work real well because you know you don't see those reds all along the Ellisville contact with the Chabawansa. It dies out outside of the neck area, so that figure doesn't, in a sense, in a sense, support your argument about that. That's all. Um, I. Uh I would agree with you, and, 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 and I also offer the other uh, observation that the relief is greatest along both the northern or the western and eastern margins of the neck, where it's closest to the south end. Right, that's so true. So you're, you're, you're enhancing the, the relief and steps in the topography are being enhanced by that river drainage incision. Right. Over time, so I, th I think that's a, 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 a the re a, the main reason why we we don't see the red continue along the entire length of things. Yeah. Right. The north, north, right. North east trend. Okay. okay. Well, I, I just, just I, that. comments well right. taken. I, we're the whole point here is we want to better illustrate this for you, make the discussion uh, more descriptive with observations, interpretations and qualify statements that need qualifying. Right. So I have a couple, I have a few more. Okay. One or two more. Okay. So with respect to figure 1A and 1B, 
Would it be possible for you to just use corners to delineate your the extent of figures two and three and to delineate the quail fault uncertainty area? Because, just, especially like in figure 1B, just where I want to look at the details, there is a yellow box that screens out the details. So you yeah, know, that's just a challenge. Like yeah. Draw in a, in a corner like. On, okay, on so like box. four little four little corners. Yeah. On all of the insets, or like the yeah. two ex figure extents as well as the quail fault, if you will. Yeah. Uncertainty projection. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I would like that because then because it just it just fuzzies up the image, and then Look. Yep. and then a comment on Figure Three C, which is the hillshade map of the northern, the northeastern mm -hmm. part of that. So that really it, that doesn't show anything. It doesn't show the, a lineament. That doesn't show a fault. It doesn't show lithologic contrast. That's just that's but very. This is this one. I'm sorry. Uh, figure three C, the hillshade map. Yes. Oh, uh, the reason I want to we want to include that is just so that you're seeing the true relief, nothing exaggerated. Right. Okay. Right. And I think that's just, it's helpful just to to see that, and you can also look for lineaments at that scale of of relief of of of, uh, of uh, relief on that. Yeah. Okay. As a reminder that that. We aren't in the Himalayas here, but so many. These are exaggerated. Okay, looks great. Okay. Uh, um, and Boss, NRC, can we go on mute for just a second?